Thank you, and good morning to everybody. Uh, the, the big kudos goes to Kelly and IMF for bringing this wonderful program to our community, to our patient, and to our institution. And um, we have been doing it almost every year. I think the last year, because of the COVID, we missed it. But prior to that, we had in-person meetings. And this year, we are meeting virtually. And hopefully, maybe next year, we'll have again in-person meeting. So uh, with that, uh, without any further ado, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I was um, instructed to talk about uh, Myeloma 101, basically to make a segue for the treatment for um, de novo diagnosis, and then moving on to Dr. Abdullah's topic of um, relapsed refractory uh, disease states. So um, multiple myeloma is a cancer of our immune system. Um, and the name of the cancer cell is called plasma cell. And on this slide, you can see some normal and some not so normal looking plasma cells. Normally, we all have plasma cells. Um, you have it, I have it. Um, and normally, it, it makes antibodies, normal antibodies to fight off infections. For some reason, if the normal plasma cells become abnormal, either by genetic mutations or translocations, environmental factors, causes we may never understand, a clone emerges. It's not that all plasma cells become malignant. Some of the plasma cells become malignant, and then they start making an abnormal antibody. They start proliferating, and they expand the bone marrow. So one can see those abnormal antibodies in the blood by a special test called serum protein electrophoresis, which is seen on the left upper panel, where you can see an abnormal spike. And that is the abnormal protein made by abnormal plasma cells. We call it M spike or monoclonal spike. Now, the Electrophoresis does not tell me what kind of myeloma we have. And for that, we go to the next step called serum immunofixation. And serum immunofixation gives us the structure of the immunoglobulin, which is the antibody, the M spike, and it could be various kinds, IgG, IgA, IgM, various kinds. And there are two free light chains, Greek letter kappa or lambda. So based on those, we can tell the abnormal antibodies specificity of either IgG kappa or IgA lambda. And as you can see, these abnormal plasma cells proliferate inside the bone marrow. It sometimes eats away through the cortical bone leaving behind some small lucent areas, we call it osteolytic lesions, which are quite characteristic of a symptomatic myeloma. Unfortunately, some of them break through the bone, and I have had patients presenting first time with acute onset of back pain and vertebral fracture. And the symptoms of myeloma at that time could be related to overcrowding of the bone marrow that leads to anemia or low blood counts, the abnormal proteins getting filtered through the kidney and clogging the kidney tubules, decreasing the kidney function, bone damage we talked about, and increased bone turnover. All of them make the multiple myeloma symptomatic. Now, old days, when we were in med school, there were not much treatment, and multiple myeloma used to be fatal within you know, two and a half to three years. But now we have made a lot of progress in the treatment, and a lot of patients with multiple myeloma are living their almost near normal life. But interestingly, this plasma cell process starts or dates back years before it becomes symptomatic. And there have been um, really good studies from Veterans Administration's hospital system that showed a person today's myeloma probably started with something called monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance six, eight, 10, 12 years ago. And then some of them progress, some of them don't. They just stay as MGAS. 
Some of them may progress to smoldering myeloma, which has more than 10% of those plasma cells inside the bone marrow, but still we do not have any of the symptoms. And then eventually 50 to 80% of them can spill out to be an active myeloma. And then it goes through symptomatic phases of response, relapse, and eventually some of them, if not treated properly or because of really serious mutations or genetic abnormalities inside the plasma cells could be refractory. But we had made real big progress. And as I was telling you that when I was in med school, at that time, um, an average life expectancy was around two and a half to three years. But now it is not unusual in my practice to see patients 15, 20 years still doing very well. And as you can see, the survival in myeloma over the several decades actually have improved. And now, in the most recent one, it seems that at least 15 to 20 percent of the patients are getting a plateau. Plateau means they have no sign of any myeloma 9, 10, 12 years after the diagnosis. Are they cured? I hope so. I'm usually very cautiously telling them most likely you're cured, but I still would not stop at 15 to 20 percent. We need to keep pushing the envelope where majority of our patients can use the word cure in myeloma. And you can hear from Dr. Abdullah that the, the, the day um, is not too far. I mean, I'm really seeing the future as quite bright. And that is because of an explosion of research and new therapy in the myeloma. Again, way back in 50s and 60s, we did not have much treatment except melphalan and prednisone. Then the transplant came, and transplant was a paradigm shift. Many patients went into deep remission, MRD negative status with transplant. And then the novel therapies, and most recently, this is the era of immunotherapy, monoclonal antibodies, bite, and now cellular immunotherapy, especially CAR T. So I, again, going to reiterate, the future appears to be quite bright as far as the diagnosis and treatment of this devastating disease. Now, stages of myeloma treatment. When we get diagnosed with multiple myeloma, uh, it is an ongoing therapy. If we're not promising a cure, our promise is deeper the remission, longer the remission lasts. So we look at a patient and we say, if the patient is transplant eligible or not transplant eligible. And based on that, we do transplantation, but initially we do induction and then followed by maintenance. So I always say that the care of myeloma is almost like a weed control unit in your backyard, and that gets little chuckle out of our patients. But I say, yeah, actually it's on the YouTube. You can look it up, Ganguly Lawn Care Myeloma, and it will show me talking about this very basic concept. So what do I mean by that? Say. 10, 12 years ago, somebody did not have myeloma and had a fantastic backyard. Now diagnosed with myeloma, the bone marrow has abnormal plasma cells and the backyard is full of wheat. Well, go to the physician and the doctor gives Revlimid, Valcade, Dexamethasone, AKA plasma cell killer. Plasma cell killers are like wheat killer in the backyard. After four or five cycles, the bone marrow looks much better near remission, very good partial remission, but the dandelions are still present one or two in the backyard, but most importantly, the roots of the dandelions are still there. But it is much better than before. So I have to say that the oncologist has done a great job gardening your bone marrow. Don't tell that I said that, but uh, gardening. But then you come to the transplanter, and I call myself not a gardener. I'm a lawn renovator. If somebody is in the Kansas City area, they would know how the grass pad man from Santa Fe and 135 comes online and tells you to strip the lawn and start fresh. And that's exactly what we do. We collect the stem cells, AKA grass seed. We give high dose chemotherapy to clean up the bone marrow and the residual plasma cells and the backyard gets completely barren 
and then we reseed the bone marrow, reseed the backyard with healthy stem cells that we have already collected and let it grow. And now it will be a lush green lawn, hopefully without any dandelion. And that's the concept of the myeloma. But again, you would not leave your lawn without a spring and fall maintenance. So you do need a maintenance program, even if we do lawn renovation, AKA stem cell transplantation. And the goal is to get to minimal residual disease where we cannot see any roots of the myeloma. So when a patient presents, the body probably has almost a trillion cancer cells. The proverbial iceberg model where you can see symptomatic myeloma. But deep down, when we are in the stringent complete remission, we still have significant amount of myeloma cells. And our goal is to push it down further to almost undetectable one in a million like an NGS CR. And eventually, I still think 15 to 20% patients may hit the target of cure and future maybe even more. So our goal is MRD negativity, minimal residual disease negativity. That's our goal. How do we get there? There are a lot of questions that are asked. Are we going to use two drugs, three drugs, and now four drugs? And if we use three or four drugs, which are the drugs? And then we talked about the role of transplant and maintenance and MRD. This was an eloquent study by SWAG, which showed compared to Revlimid Dex versus Revlimid Valgate Dex means doublet versus triplet, clearly triplet was the winner. So the standard of care right now in United States in a patient with newly diagnosed myeloma should be a triplet not a doublet. Now, do I not ever use doublet? Of course I do, but that depends on the patient criteria, frailty, other comorbidities, kidney, counts, but usually uh, a newly diagnosed patients should be given a triplet. And then comes the era of immunotherapy, and Deratumumab is one of the monoclonal antibodies that are against the myeloma cells. And now we also have isatuximab, another monoclonal antibody now approved in the treatment for multiple myeloma. Now, these drugs are usually not used upfront, except Deratumumab is now approved in transplant ineligible patients not transplant eligible patients with Revlimid and DEX. So data RevDEX is now FD approved for transplant ineligible patients where it is compared to RevDEX and clearly it shows data Tumumab is superior in the response as well as in the progression free survival. Now because it is FDA approved for transplant ineligible patients, I have started seeing some of my patients getting deratumumab upfront and then referred to me for potential transplantation. Um, so you would be seeing that happening in the community, but really data RD is for transplant ineligible patient. For transplant eligible patient, there is a combination that is called data VMP, which is used more frequently in Europe compared to United States. We use data RVD sometimes in our patients. And you may have heard about that quad combination. Quad combination is data with RVD. Now, this is the trial. We at KU were a part of it called Griffin Tire, where data RVD was compared to RVD, and then the patients got transplanted, then had some consolidation and maintenance either with data rev or rev. And this is a very recent trial. We do not have a long-term data. We do have response criteria, and clearly you can see the responses of the data RVD compared to RVD is better and as we continue the consolidation phase, the depth of response increases on the data RVD compared to the RVD. 
is this the future standard of care? I do not know. I personally do not use quad right up front, but if somebody uses, nothing wrong with that if the insurance approves it. I personally like to keep the data to my map for future use, but this is something that is coming. The other question that I get heard is I've used the chemo. How long do I take the chemo, especially if I'm not going for the transplant? And that question was answered by this particular trial called the first trial, where an Revlimid and low-dose dexamethasone was continued until disease progression compared to two fixed cycles. And clearly, the RD continuous was much better compared to the relapse or the progression than stopping the treatment. So if somebody decides not to undergo transplant, I usually continue this at least for eight to 12 months, and then based on the tolerability, go to the Revlimid continuously or Revlimid with low dose DEX. So continuous treatment is much better than fixed treatment. And I mentioned autologous transplantation improves progression-free survival in a transplant-eligible patient. If somebody is transplant-ineligible, then definitely that would not apply. So this is a HOVON trial, very recent trial, where patients received Cyborg-D, the Valcate cytoxin and DEX, followed by stem cell collection, then chemo versus transplant, and then randomized to consolidation or no consolidation, and then maintenance. Bottom line is chemo ongoing versus transplant. And here you can see the progression-free survival all over the board was better with the transplant compared to non-transplant. And so the trial conclusion was upfront transplantation significantly prolonged PFS. Now, the uh, purists will say, how about the overall survival? And I have to admit, yes, the overall survival has not been shown to be better with transplantation, both in European as well as US trials. But the follow-up to show the overall response in a disease like multiple myeloma or follicular lymphoma may take years to show. And also with many, many new drugs available and quickly if somebody has a disease progression changing the therapy, we may not ever be able to show overall survival advantage. So I usually tell my patients, if somebody gets a transplant, then uh, your chance of remaining in remission is longer with transplant than without transplant. So the same thing is asked by this question. My doctor told me my myeloma is in good remission. Should I go for transplant now? Or should I uh, harvest and hold the stem cells and do the transplant when the disease progresses? And that question was answered by this trial called IFM trial and the Dana-Farber trial, now a very good CTN trial. The IFM, which is the French, the European part of the trial is complete and is reported where people had gotten the RVD and then the transplant and then RVD versus only chemo and transplant at relapse. And the answer is again, very clear. People who got the transplant, they had a better progression-free survival. So the conclusion of even that trial is that transplant is safe. The transplant rate and mortality is probably less than 1% now, and it is associated with improved four-year progression-free survival. One other fact that came out is minimal residual disease negativity. If somebody is minimal residual disease negative, their progression is far less compared to if somebody still is MRD positive. And with the transplant, the chance of getting MRD negativity is higher than not getting the transplant. So I am a proponent that if somebody is transplant eligible, should undergo transplant now rather than delayed, because delay may mean the disease may mutate, it may get more resistant, 
a lot of things can happen. Many patients actually never get to the transplant. So I would say go for the transplant if you are transplant eligible. But is there a cure? We talked about this iceberg model, and clearly you can see deeper the remission, the chance of the disease coming back is delayed. So with transplant, average progression may be three to five years, and if we can continue with our maintenance or consolidation and keep the MRD negative status, maybe we'll be pushing the envelope and that 15 to 20% of cure number might increase in future. So we need to keep on trying to get rid of this last MRD positive clones in the bone marrow of our patients. And I think that's probably will be the future plan for all the researches. This is the LEN maintenance after high dose transplant. And clearly we talked about that unless you do something to get the weeds off the ground after the lawn renovation, the weeds will come back. And that clearly shows after seven years of follow-up, an overall survival advantage if somebody gets some form of maintenance compared to somebody who does not get a maintenance. Now, there are different kinds of myeloma. And at these days and ages, we have uh, capability of genetic profiling and standard risk and high risk categories with cytogenetics and gene expression profiling. So in this trial, the high risk category patients had a very high risk of relapse. Those patients were placed on maintenance that was not only Revlimid, but also a proteasome inhibitor like Valcate. So after the transplant, 90 days, 80 days after, the Emory group from Atlanta, Georgia, decided to start low-dose Revlimid, like 10 milligram, low-dose bortezomib, and steroid. I call it you know, RVD light or diet RVD, low-dose. And that clearly showed almost 90% positive response after three years on this high-risk patients with multiple myeloma. Now, there have been some randomized trials that really could not show the difference, but I think if somebody has high-risk chromosomes, they should consider maintenance not only with Revlimid, but also with a proteasome inhibitor. Now, that has gone taken to another level that we are running. Dr. Abdullah was the principal investigator of this trial, where people are getting not only LEN maintenance, but LEN DERA maintenance. And the next question is, if I am MRD negative, do I really need to continue the maintenance forever? Well, this trial is trying to answer that if somebody is MRD negative for two years, can we stop the maintenance therapy? We don't have the answer yet, but we will get the answer in future. Are there patients where we do not need to have any more maintenance therapy and they are cured? Well, I hope so. So this is my last slide and my most favorite slide, that relative survival ratio. And I've been showing this slide in every one of my talk. Relative survival ratio means what's my chance of living in future decades compared to my age, ethnicity, and my risk factors. So for example, if somebody um, is 60 year old and has multiple heart lung conditions, the relative survival ratio may be lower than the general population, general population being 1.0. So going back to myeloma, when people are diagnosed upfront with one trillion cancer cells. And if we don't do anything, think about 1960s and 70s, the relative survival ratio was just a few months, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 compared to the general population. But now we have the novel therapy, RVD. Then we have the transplant. The relative ratio goes up 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Now we have the maintenance. Now we have the immunotherapy, we have the CAR-T and we have some patients where the relative ratio now is approaching general population. So they're living like anybody else, 
with a diagnosis of multiple myeloma, but no sign of the multiple myeloma. And that's going to be the future. And that's the dream of all myeloma doctors uh, who treat patients with this uh, cancer. So take home message, 15, I would say not 10 to 15, maybe 15 to 20% of the patients may be cured by modern treatment. I still think early and upfront transplantation is the standard of care for transplant eligible patients and hence an early referral to a transplant center should also be the standard and risk stratification, personalized medicine, like not every drug is for everybody. We need to think about a patient and take care of the patient holistically. Not only I'm taking care of the cancer, I'm also taking care of their life, their socioeconomic status, their grand children's uh, uh, birthday party, all of those should be in our mind when we devise a treatment strategy for our patients. And with that, I'm going to say that we were in 1950s and now we moved on to more genetic understanding. And now we are really, really talking about the future of personalized medicine, giving the treatment that a person really needs with one goal, can we cure this disease? And with that, I will probably say thank you and end my talk. Hi, Deck, and especially the last slide. I've been doing this with the International Myeloma Foundation for 20 years. I remember when they sent me out to go talk to support groups, they gave me a little card and it said thalidomide on it. I darn near quit the foundation. But then I heard about a lot of things coming down the pipeline. And I'm hearing them come down now. So it's really something. Hey, Sid, can you see the questions? I can see the questions. And actually, the questions are um, 987. So why don't we, I can see up to five. OK. I can see question number one, two, three, four. So why don't I answer the question that I can see? The last question that I have is, are there new treatment options for patients with smoldering myeloma who are not high risk? First, let me talk about high risk smoldering myeloma. The standard of care still in 2021 is no treatment, but you're right. Patients with high risk smoldering myeloma would have a very high risk of progressing to multiple myeloma. So there are many centers that are starting treatment with Revlimid Dex. Actually, the Spanish trial showed overall survival advantage. We have a trial with Dr. Abdullah where we are using multiple treatments and even collecting the stem cells and randomization for high-risk myeloma. I know of no treatment options for patients without high risk because remember, Treatments are not without risk either, and not everybody will be pros uh, progressing to multiple myeloma. So you would be treating 50% of the patients without high-risk multiple myeloma with potentially harmful chemotherapy who would never, ever develop myeloma. So I would not recommend any treatment option for non-high-risk multiple myeloma. Uh, do you so see Robert? I can, do I can you, see question right. one, two, three, four. So that's, I'm only seeing the last questions. I see, um, can you go over the factors determining if a patient is transplant eligible? Absolutely. Basically, transplant eligibility is whether if somebody has the capability and functional status to undergo high dose therapy. So old days, we used to put age as a marker. Age is not a bar. It is not the chronological age. It is a physiological age. I have that transplant in 81-year-old who can easily beat me in a cross-country or arm wrestle, which is, by the way, not a big thing to beat me. But um, I have not run transplant in a 45-year-old who has multiple comorbidities. So we also institute frailty. So every patient prior to the transplantation, especially 60 plus, undergoes a very extensive frailty testing in our clinic for the transplant eligibility. So transplant eligibility based on um, functional status, frailty, and other comorbidities. Um, so depending on that, we decide. And it's a, it's a very thorough checklist. Okay. Uh... Do you see the one I received at first transplant at Cyborg D with Revomed maintenance, number seven? Number seven. Okay, number seven. I received first treatment Cyborg D 
with revlimid maintenance, VGPR for three years, then second treatment, case ID with CR for 3.5 years. Can I go back to one of these treatments or try something else on my third treatment? Okay, so no transplant, 65 years old. So um, this is a question about the relapsed, relapsed setting. And I think it is fair to have these questions for Dr. Abdullah uh, or okay. for the panel. So I would like to entertain questions pertaining to 101 or upfront. Uh, otherwise, Dr. Abdullah um, we can, should have. Uh, yeah, let's wait for him to do his talk and then we can uh, go from there. Uh, one other one, 11, how should smoldering myeloma? So I have a question is, please clarify again, the difference between low-risk smoldering and high-risk smoldering uh, myeloma. It's a very good question. Um, so as you know, there are some um, smoldering myelomas that we used to call smoldering before are now myeloma because of the myeloma-defining events or MDE. The three myeloma-defining events, that means the patients are otherwise asymptomatic, would be more than 60% plasma cells in the bone marrow. If the involved versus uninvolved free light chain ratio is greater, greater than 100, or an MRI showing more than one lesions, each more than five millimeter in size in the bone, those patients will have more than 80% chance of progressing. Now, if somebody with smoldering myeloma has the M spike more than two gram, the ratio is more than 20, and if the bone marrow has more than 20% plasma cells, so they are not myeloma-defining event, but they are potentially could be considered as high risk. We call it 20 to 20 criteria. 20% plasma cells, two gram protein, and greater than 20 ratio. So there are various factors that are involved in classifying smoldering myeloma into the standard risk versus high risk. And based on that, the clinical trials have been designed. Okay. And uh, let's do this with the last question. How do patients with multiple myeloma know they are cured over five or 10 years or longer under your protocol? This is a fantastic question. I really, really like to answer this question as my maybe um, time constraint, my, my last question. So, so, so the answer to that question is not known, but um, there are data that suggests that if somebody is in stringent complete remission or MRD negative, at least for eight to nine years, there are papers from Arkansas, and Dr. Abdullah was present when this paper was ready in Arkansas, that those patients hardly ever relapse. So my answer to the question is, if somebody is MRD negative for five or eight years beyond the treatment, I think very cautiously we can stop the maintenance and monitor. But I'm still not convinced that the answer and the jury is out. And the reason is this. In the IMF trial, I wish I had the slides. There were slides of MRD negative patients and slides of MRD positive patients. And clearly, MRD positive patients relapse more. But the patients who are MRD negative, their curve was looking very nice and up there. But even then, there were patients that relapsed over subsequent years. So I'll be extremely cautious if somebody's MRD negative and we stop the treatment, we need to monitor them. And MRD negativity is not just one time snapshot. If somebody is MRD negative for subsequent tests, like one or two years, then I feel more comfortable of stopping the therapy and wait and watch. And then maybe after five years, we can start using the word cure. Still, it is in the realm of a future crystal ball, the proverbial crystal ball. This is my hope that they are cured, but we do not have the confirmatory data yet. But the curves are very, very positive. After five to 10 years, MRD negative or stringent complete remission, the chance of relapse is very low. Wow, that's very exciting. I think that your presentation covered a lot of information. I just wanted to thank you for taking the time on a Saturday. And I 
we look forward to your additional comments as the day goes on. So there are many other questions. We can always take it at the end as a panel. Yes, that, that'll be fine. We'll wrap that up there. So we'll save the questions and you'll see them.